Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. I'm Emeritus Professor Glenn McConnell. I've just finished a great fun chat with Katrine de Bock, who is a professor from ETH Zurich, which is the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. And this is an amazing and very strong university, um, which is ranked either eighth or 11th in the world, depending on the ranking system, and has had 22 Nobel laureates, including uh, Albert Einstein. So it's quite an achievement to be a full professor there in itself. Um, so today we talked about unraveling the mysteries of the vasculature in muscle. So mainly talking about blood vessels, but also we talked about muscle injury. So um, Katrina is an expert on, on you know, what makes up the blood vessels, the different cells. So we talked about that. But also we focused mainly on how the blood vessels respond to exercise both acutely so during the exercise to increase blood flow, but especially we talked about how um, exercise increases the number of capillaries, so the actual blood vessels in the muscle, right? So it's a very important adaptation to exercise that occurs. So um, we talked about what are the mechanisms involved. We also talked about other areas that she's interested in as well, such as how exercise increases protein synthesis in muscle. So specifically how exercise increases leucine sensitivity, which is very interesting as it's analogous to other areas we've talked about in regards to how exercise increases insulin sensitivity in muscle. I really think you'll get a lot out of this one, so stick around. Uh, hi, Katrine. Welcome to Inside Exercise. Thanks for coming on. Hi, Glenn. Yeah. Good morning. I assume it's already <laughs> late afternoon for you. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, no problems. Yeah, it's 7.30 for me and it's like um, morning for you. So today we're going to be talking about unraveling the mysteries of the vasculature and muscle. Can we just start off talking about like, you know, when you talk about vasculature, what is the vasculature? What makes up the vasculature? What are the cells and whatever? The vasculature are basically blood vessels, right? Uh, mm -hmm. A whole system uh, composed of blood, blood vessels and the main cell type so the role of blood vessels is really to deliver oxygen and nutrients mm -hmm. from either the lungs oxygen or nutrients from uh, the digestive tract or the liver to every every single cell in mm -hmm. in the body so that was the the yeah the canonical description that is a canonical description of mm -hmm. the role of the vasculature we know now it's different but fine so, and the main cell type composing the vascular wall are endothelial cells. Uh, in arteries, those endothelial cells are covered by smooth muscle cells and, mm -hmm. uh, and some other places they are covered by pericytes, but, but also in small capillaries, it's, it's almost a naked layer of uh, endothelial cells. Endothelial. Yeah. So, so, you know, if you're pumping the blood from the heart, we're just going to go real basic. And you know, obviously there's a lot of pressure there. So you, you need to have a thick sort of wall, which is like the arteries away from the heart. Mm -hmm. And then you've got that inner layer of endothelial cells, which we'll talk Indeed. a lot about. And then it becomes sort of thinner and thinner. And then you get to the capillaries, which is like where the oxygen and the nutrients and CO2 and everything are moving. And there it's just like the capillary cells. Yeah. And then you go to the veins back to the heart. Yeah. So, so yeah. So what are the cells? So you mentioned the endothelial cells and we'll talk about them quite a lot. So this is this very thin layer which things are moving through. Um, yeah, so why don't you just talk about those cells a bit, you know, what uh, and, and what they do and why they're important, and then maybe some other cells. Because I know you were very interested in all sorts of cells, mm -hmm. ones that, you know, people hadn't even thought about till recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's clear that those endothelial cells, they are the, the most important cell types in cell type in the vascular wall. They have they have a variety of functions. They they ensure that there is no clotting uh, of of spontaneous clotting of uh, of the blood. Yeah. They ensure that there is optimal flow of of the blood, so that really reduces turbulence and and yeah, uh, yeah. these things. So it's basically guiding the blood. At the same time, they they are also important in providing oxygen and nutrients to to the micro environment. So they they closely interact with the micro environment. This interaction, though, is something that is very poorly characterized up till now, um, and something that we are very interested uh, in in studying. Mm -hmm. Now, um, so those endothelial cells also, whenever 
there is a, a shortage of oxygen and nutrients, uh, for instance, inside the muscle. Maybe we can we can focus a bit on on the muscle here. Yes. Then those endothelial cells really play a crucial role in. Uh, making new blood vessels, a process that is called angiogenesis, mm -hmm. and uh, they do they do by they do this by starting to proliferate by forming to uh, by by forming new uh, blood vessels, and in this way they somewhat adapt oxygen and nutrient delivery to the requirements of the the tissue. So it's very well described, for instance, that people who exercise or exercise training, mm -hmm. this leads to an increase in capillary density uh, in the muscle. And this is uh, caused by angiogenesis or, or uh, new blood vessel formation. Yes. So it's quite amazing because, I mean, I guess if people don't really know how it all works, they might think, you know, when you're exercising, your heart increases, you know, it's pumping and it pumps more per blood, uh, more per beat. And, you know, and therefore the muscle gets more blood. That's, that's true in some ways, but, but what happens is you're, you know, maybe if you just talk about how, you know, you shut down flow to some areas and you increase the flow to the muscle and, and then eventually the muscle then adapts if you're doing that enough to think, oh, I need to increase my ability to deliver blood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously during exercise, and this happens very early on during exercise, the the, the capillaries, they, they open up, right? Uh, I actually, so there are all, there's all the studies from August Crow on, on capillary mm -hmm. recruitment uh, uh, during exercise uh, uh, and I and how this uh, this is orchestrated but we are more interested into into looking at what happens after exercise so how yes. do the does the muscle then adapt to it right so acutely you see vasodilation so increased blood in flow muscle. into the muscle mm -hmm. whereas blood flow in other areas is more shut down so there is basically a rewiring of of the flow mm -hmm. right in mm -hmm. in the body focused to uh feed or nurture those those um, organs or tissues that that have higher oxygen and nutrient uh, requirement so this is acutely but then after exercise the body adapts to it so mm -hmm. there is a whole molecular program that is switched on in order to yeah improve perfusion of the tissue endurance on the long run exercise Endurance, Endurance exercise, exercise. Yes. It's yes. very well yes. known to, to increase blood mm. vessel density uh, mm -hmm. inside, inside the muscle. And actually what is very, very interesting is that the molecular mechanisms why, by which this happens are very, very poorly understood. Mm -hmm. um, and this is one of the main research interests uh, in my lab. And the reason why we are actually so interested in this and and to study the link with with exercise and and training is that uh in many uh elderly people or or diseases you see that there is an impairment in the formation of new blood vessels and this is a very relevant and a very important uh topic because for instance in wound healing uh you also require new blood vessel formation and this is really required for the wounds to, to heal. And this is something that, that is often deficient in, in elderly people or in, in people with, with uh, diabetes uh, and, and for many regenerative purposes. So if we, we feel that if we can understand how blood vessels grow in the muscle, we can also maybe come up with, with novel uh, therapeutic opportunities for regenerative purposes. Yes, yeah, so this is an amazing thing, isn't it? Because if you uh, inactive, you if anything, you have less capillaries. Mm -hmm. And if you are uh, active and you exercise, train endurance at training, you get more capillaries. But not only that, you know, you mentioned those endothelial cells. You actually become what's called, you have better endothelial function as well. So mm -hmm. maybe you just talk a little bit about that, how you, know, how you can, you can um, dilate more in response to stimuli like insulin or or blood, you know, with blood pressure or whatever, you can actually, um, yes, or did I lose you there? Yeah, I mean, you, you lose me a bit there. I mean, that, now we are moving a lot to the, to, to okay. the physiological uh, side. I just, uh, I guess what I wanted to say was just, just that it's not just the number of capillaries you get, but you also get better function of the blood vessels as well. Yeah, this is, this is, mm -hmm. uh, this is clear. Um, yeah. Uh, not only on the microvascular side, but but also in the, on the the the, the macro vessels. Uh, and, I mean, you have uh, 
lower chances for atherosclerosis, uh, better endothelial health, endothelial function. So they respond better to vasodilators. Uh, so th this is clear. Blood existing. pressure. Yeah, yeah. So it's multifactorial. So let, why don't we give you a chance to actually get in there with your, your mechanistic work, which I know you've been doing. So so what, what, so if you start, if you're exercising, your exercise training, you end up with more capillaries per muscle fiber. How do you think that actually occurs? Just keep in mind, you know, try not to blow everyone, you know, like going crazy, but just, uh, yeah. So the way this happens is still highly debated, but there are actually, or basically two mechanisms through which new blood vessels can form. And the first one is vessel sprouting. And this basically means that one endothelial cell mm -hmm. in the blood vessel uh, breaks down the, the extracellular matrix, so starts to behave differently and moves out of the blood vessel and then grows a new blood vessel, right? Wow. So you, you basically mm -hmm. have it sprout, a new blood vessel growing out of an existing one. So you end up this with two... You get two that way or just the yeah the so one you get two. you have your existing yeah. one and then you mm -hmm. have your newly formed one it's it's right. it's basically um yeah finding its way uh alongside the muscle fiber and then hooks up to another one mm -hmm. then they form a lumen and then they they get perfused so this this is right. one way and the telial sprouting mm -hmm. and then there is another way that blood vessels can form and this is into susceptive or, or splitting angiogenesis. And this is basically, um, or goes like this, that the, the, the blood vessel initially grows in diameter. Uh -huh. And then all of a sudden it splits. So there are small pillars formed inside the blood vessel and then it splits and it basically splits up in two blood vessels. Uh -huh. okay. And the advantage of the latter is that you don't need to break down the matrix outside the, the, the blood vessel. Mm. Um, that presumably it's it's less less angio, uh, less energetically um, demanding for, uh, yeah. for for endothelial cells. And I think many people assume that this is what happens uh, upon exercise, but the evidence for this is not completely lacking, but but it's actually very, yeah, very low. The main reason for this is that it requires advanced imaging uh, tools to to really look at those uh, splitting uh, splitting blood vessels. Yeah, I was going to ask you, how would you do? Would you actually have to see one in the middle of you know? Yeah. Yeah, at this moment, this is still what, what it takes. So you really have to go and look for these splits, these, these small pillars inside blood vessels that then enlarge and, and then lead to, to splitting. And then the main reason for this is actually that the, the mechanism by which this happens is completely unknown. So we know mm -hmm. it happens, but where it happens, when it happens, presumably the increase in flow upon exercise might be one of the, the, the players involved in this, but we still have to go and look for them. It's not that we can stain for a molecular marker or, or, or test molecular markers to see whether we have in, in increased splitting, no. uh, blood vessel splitting. Um, so we actually know very little of this. But is the sprouting pretty accepted or you know, the other, you said there's the sprouting and the- Yeah, so yeah, yeah. the sprouting is, is very much accepted in a developmental setting, right? So okay. de developmental angiogenesis, like in the brain or in the eye, this is heavily uh, controlled by sprouting. In the muscle, it is not very well accepted. I mean, people mm. assumed until very recently Assume. that mm -hmm. that it is sprouting angiogenesis, but to be very honest, I am not so sure about it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think uh, uh, the, the groups that are really looking into it, they get, they they are getting more and more convinced that that we are actually looking at the splitting of blood vessels rather than the formation. I mean, sprouting angiogenesis. I'm oh, sorry, they're, they're, they're thinking that, what are they thinking? That, that it's the splitting, not the sprouting. So yeah, that, that it's the splitting. Okay, so that's sort of yeah. challenging that. Yeah. That actually reminds me of, um, so, so I sometimes ask people this question because I just get the feeling that, you know, already we're seeing that you can't just assume things in science, right? So I, I quite often ask the question, I say, look, 
you're relatively young. You can't comment on things like this anymore, but you look relatively young, even though you somehow have four kids, you said. <laughs> but, but, you know, and you're a professor, so everything you do must work, right? Everything, every study you do it works, is that right? Well, uh, I wouldn't <laughs> say so. It's sarcasm, yeah. <laughs> if, if it did, I'd be worried. I'd be like, hang on, check her data. Mm. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, a critical characteristic of any scientist is resilience and the way to deal with negative mm. data, to go and hide in your office for one or two hours, be very, very disappointed mm. about another negative result, then mm. find negative your courage result again. Is a pet hate for me. If you see some of my earlier podcasts, I say... Because, you know, you, you you get this finding, it's not what you expect, there's no effect or whatever. And then you send it off, oh, negative result. Well, if I hadn't done the study, you wouldn't know that, you know what I mean? And quite often it's important because then it takes you off on another. Yeah. I, I hate this thing, well, this negative yeah. result. I always say to my people, the data are the data, but also negative mm -hmm. results don't exist, right? It means it's, it's something else. Mm -hmm. Or in the hypothesis that you put forward, um, yeah, something, we overlooked something. So, I mean, all very often negative data lead to the most exciting stories. And, uh, exactly. uh, and, and this is obviously the advantage of, of working in, in a molecular biology lab. We can redo experiments, change the settings of the cell. I mean, change a time point where we are looking at the specific exercise adaptation, mm -hmm. for instance, or one specific thing we are, we are looking at. And from that, from that point of view, we, we are, I think, a bit in a um, luxury position when compared to, to many people that, that do human and tra translational ah. work, where it's, I can imagine, even more frustrating and uh, you have to define your time points on beforehand and then it doesn't work. You have to start I guess it's a, a double-edged sword or whatever yeah. it is. There's pros and cons because naturally if you're doing cells, so when you're talking about molecular, you're doing cells, you're doing animal studies, then you've got to explain or think, how can I apply this to the human? Because we're not... Yeah that interested in the mouse's you know blood vessel development we're actually applying it so then you've got to deal with that right but the, yeah. as you say it's harder i remember the first i don't know 40 studies i did or something was was all humans mm -hmm. and then i started doing my, mice and then i did some some cells and i thought i thought wow this is going to be so easy you don't have to like recruit the subjects you just like get it but it's like no because things still go wrong things, you know <laughs> you still got to troubleshoot and whatever else yeah, so yeah. i think yeah. science is meant to and, and then again if you think if we got what we expected to every time it'd be kind of boring after a while right <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah maybe yes it is because i can still vividly remember the few times i had really a breakthrough result or a western blot in my hands i mean i can still recall in my postdoc where we all of a sudden saw the expression of this enzyme going up and and me running with the I mean at that time we were still mm. physically developing our Western well, running around with 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 the, <laughs> the Western blot in my hands in the in the mm. corridors of the lab super excited and then trying to nail down the mechanism for one year not finding anything only <laughs> negative data very frustrating yes. but these these few these few moments of enlightening where you where you think think you have found something think uh, something important those i still remember oh yeah yeah very well and i think this is what what makes life keeps you going so, so, so funny. yeah so with the excited. western blot just to explain to people you 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 load like you have this gel and you load like protein so you can take a muscle biopsy or some else or a cell you load the proteins they run based on their yeah. charge etc and then you throw on like an antibody and you can actually see how much of that protein is in there it's a very nifty nifty method but the seeing yeah. the seeing only occurs in the end right i mean it's exactly. only in the end you, see, end you see a band popping up and then you have to end. quantify it and, uh, now one thing we we talked about just before the uh you know before we actually nailed down what we're going to go through is you said how you look at different cell types in the blood vessels and how they cross talk with each other i mean i'm interested in that so how the cells are talking to each so, other so so in the muscle the blood vessel actually uh, provides some kind of niche where many other cells like to reside. For instance, you have parasites around the, bl the blood vessel, but they have a supportive role for, uh, for the blood vessel. But also 
there are several fibroblast populations that are localized next to the blood vessels and that physically interact with with the blood vessels so this is one uh, and we know now more and more that fibroblasts play a very important role in muscle repair and likely even in orchestrating adaptations to training and then for instance you have you have satellite cells and even those satellite cells are like let's put it like this squeezed in between the muscle fiber and and then the 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 extracellular matrix of the, the basement membrane uh nonetheless they are localized very very close to the to the vasculature um the same holds true for 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 macrophages we have some resident immune cells in these in, are white in cells yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah and these immune cells what they do there it's actually it's actually very poorly uh, poorly understood but they are there and quite some of those you have them since you were born and they reside in the muscle and they stay there uh, for more or less the rest of your life also those reside very very close to to the vasculature so they cross talk and uh, during muscle repair, for instance, there are signals that are released by the endothelial cells that guide that guide muscle muscle repair, and this is what we are really interested in 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 looking looking at to to really understand how do all these cells communicate with each other to ensure muscle adaptations to training, but also to ensure uh, muscle repair. And this is this is really really important because. Whenever you have muscle damage or after an exercise bout, there is this very specific sequence of events that, that needs to happen. First, uh, uh, you have some immune cells flowing in. They take care of um, uh, removing all the damaged fibers or, or, yeah, some, yeah. Yeah, some of the, mm -hmm. or the, maybe if some, some of the ECM is ruptured so during eccentric exercise. So they take matrix. care of uh -huh. And only then, when this has happened, then the satellite cells. So the, those are the stem cells that, that reside inside the muscle and that ensure muscle repair, so to speak. They can only get activated once all the dirt has been removed. And only mm -hmm. then they start to proliferate. And then actually some of the fibroblasts that are also there, they recruit those muscle stem cells to the damaged muscle fiber, to the area of, of damage. And then they, they make sure that the, the, the muscle uh, stem cell can fuse with the damaged fiber or can form a, a new uh, fiber. And this, so muscle repair and even adaptations to training, they really require timed interactions between a lot of cell types. And uh, these in, these interactions, this is really what we are what hey, what we are looking for. Can can I ask you a question that um, I know we talked beforehand? Ab Abigail Mackey was on the podcast as well, and and she was talking about some of this stuff. I wonder if I can ask you a similar question. You're saying the the timing and and, uh, and everything has to be in order. What about you know putting ice? You know, a bit of a practical thing. You know, people do rest, ice compression, elevation. They take anti-inflammatories and whatever. Is 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 that timing? You know, is that potentially can muck things up or you know well yeah well rest ice compression and elevation this is mostly when you really have um yeah a rupture right uh or, or uh, yeah oh that's true um like a sprained ankle and then or this and the, yes. the main the main reason for this is to initially limit an exaggerated inflammatory response yes. right uh, so that that's what what uh, what it's used for. So obviously, if you have too many inflammatory cells uh, entering the muscle after rupture or after after damage, uh, so to speak, then this delays regeneration. But the other hand is, or the other side is also true. It's known that, for instance, excessive intake of anti-inflammatory drugs that this limits adaptations to training and this limits repair for exactly the same uh, for exactly okay. that reason that i explained you before mm. we need an optimized inflammatory response in order to ensure re uh, repair this cannot be exaggerated that's why we put some eyes uh, on there initially uh but it should happen, right? And uh, for this reason, taking a lot of anti-inflammatory drugs is, uh, from my point of view, not uh, not not the best uh, thing you can okay. do. 
Okay, okay. well, that's interesting. Size or, uh, or muscle damage. You were talking about some mechanisms that, um, you know, that exercise would be affecting, uh, you know, blood vessel growth, angiogenesis, whatever. What do we know about that? I, I, I've actually done some stuff with nitric oxide and there were some studies where they gave like nitric oxide inhibitors, like blockers, like LNMMA, and they looked at angiogenesis and whatever. Is that still like a thing? Like what are they actually thinking is regulating it nowadays? Yeah, so, so it is clear that uh, flow plays an important role in this. So whenever you, you exercise, the flow in your muscle capillary goes up massively. And, and this is indeed true, where people have used NO inhibitors uh, uh, to really limit perfusion um, during, during exercise and, and limit flow. And this also reduces angiogenesis. Ah, so that's, so that's proof that flow is, okay. Because nitric oxide is a, what's called a vasodilator. It opens the blood vessels. Indeed. And you're saying because they're using that, that NOS inhibitor, it's not so much saying that nitric oxide is important. It's saying that flow is important because yes. you're blocking yeah. the flow. So okay. Yeah. Yeah. So people okay. have re really looked at it in, uh, in, uh, yeah, for a flow mediated, mm -hmm. uh, uh, mechanisms, um, less NO mediated. So obviously I know uh, yeah, opens up the blood vessels, uh, even it might increase permeability has several roles, even in endothelial biology, but it has mostly been linked or at least the link between NO and angiogenesis in the muscle has been, has been linked to each other, um, yeah, via flow so to speak. And okay. it's, it's clear that you need an increase in flow to, to ensure uh, the formation of new blood vessels. But there is also this, this uh, VGF, so this vascular endothelial growth factor that, that is crucial for this. So likely it's a combination of flow uh, with um, some angiogenic growth factors that are secreted by the muscle during exercise. Um, and 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 some yeah changes inside the endothelial cells that that co that contribute to it and then they collaborate in order to uh, to ensure new vessel formation. Okay. And what about HIF one alpha? So hypoxia inducible factor one alpha. So you know people often think during exercise you're going to get like hypoxia. I mean you actually don't get that much depending on the exercise. Is that like a thing? Is that playing a role yeah. at all? Or? I'm actually happy that you you say the same than I do because I also always doubt whether there is really a lot of hypoxia yes. in the muscle uh, yes. during exercise, even though mm. you read in 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 many reviews that HIF uh, is is involved in in training adaptations. Actually, the evidence for this is 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 not not compelling, so to speak. And uh, even in the contrary, the, the the people that have made, I mean, knocked out HIF, so to speak, in the in the muscle, they have seen a completely different phenotype. But, okay. so HIF is the hypoxia inducible factor. And uh, it, it becomes active whenever there is a lack of oxygen. But what uh, is, is, is less well known is that it also becomes active whenever there is oxidative stress, whenever there is uh, metabolic stress in, in the muscle. So it's actually not that easy to link lack of oxygen with activity uh, of HIF. And if uh, there yes. is HIF activation in the muscle, mm -hmm. I presume it's likely because of a combination of metabolic stress, oxidative stress that then ensure muscle uh, muscle this, adaptation. this sounds similar again it sounds like i'm flogging my own podcast which so <laughs> earlier we had um uh, a while back we had um page geiger talking about heat shock proteins in ah, muscle yeah, yeah. and it was a similar thing because like you're saying with hif1 alpha it's not just hypoxia that activates it well same with heat shock proteins like she said heat activates it but even cold activates it it's, it's like a stress response so it's like everything in physiology and then you add exercise on top it gets even more complicated it's more complicated than we we think yeah yeah, yeah? is that fair to say but, it's, it's pretty complicated. yeah i i agree i mean in the end mm. uh, exercise is an adaptive response to stress right uh, stress inside uh, the muscle and uh, likely many 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 factors are involved in uh, orchestrating yeah. that that response and coordinating coordinating it. Okay. we talked a bit earlier about some of the models so we just vaguely you talked about um how nowadays you're not really human so what are the models you're doing and and one one reason i asked you that is i saw a tweet 
that you sent, you were talking about, uh, ooh, girl, girl Irma presenting at a conference uh, about single cell analysis and path pathological and physiological angiogenesis. So I'm thinking, how do you actually look, use a single cell to look at angiogenesis? So, you know, production of new blood cells. So why don't you just tell us a bit about the, the models you yeah. use, the methods, yeah. yeah. So, so what we have been looking at uh, quite intensively in the, in the recent past is whether or not there is only one endothelial cell right mm -hmm. and you can look at it from a whole body point of view for instance the endothelial cell in the brain likely has a different function than in the than the endothelial cell in the liver or the endothelial cell in the muscle right so there is this what we call organotypic um mm -hmm heterogeneity in, in endothelial cells. So the, these, mm. the, even though there is an endothelial cell, the endothelial cell doesn't exist. And dependent on the organ in which it resides, it has a different function and different characteristics. So we looked at it in even more, in even greater detail inside the muscle. And, and what we do for this is we just isolate endothelial cells from the muscle and we sequence every single cell, meaning that we we map the genetic fingerprint of every single endothelial cell inside the muscle. And then using bioinformatic approaches, try to understand whether all of these endothelial cells are the same. Mm. And this is what we did. And what we found is that they, there is a great heterogeneity in, in endothelial cells. So obviously we find uh, arterial endothelial cells in the muscle. So those are the ones that bring the oxygenated uh, mm -hmm. uh, blood. We found venous endothelial cells. So those are the big vessels that that drain the blood and bring it back to uh, to mm -hmm. the heart. And the... But we also find uh, found quite large heter heterogeneity in capillary endothelial cells. And and actually mm -hmm. we found some endothelial cells which are metabolically very active and whenever you 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 make them form new vessels they immediately start to form new vessels and then there was another pool of endothelial cells capillary endothelial cells that whatever you want to do to do you stimulate them with growth factors you make them form new vessels they didn't move they didn't want to do anything hmm. and we found um that uh, the ones that that really form new v vessels, those are the ones that are actually metabolically very active. Mm -hmm. Basically, they are ready to or metabolically ready to sprint and to to make a new vessel whenever they are asked to do so. And we we then um, looked at this in in a bit more detail in in the muscle. And what we found is actually that those endothelial cells which are ready to make new vessels, that those are localized in the proximity of oxidative fibers. So the fibers that are more Beautiful. vascularized and, and respond more to training, mm -hmm. those are the fibers yeah, where, where the blood vessels are composed mainly of those. And they're probably uh, right next to the mitochondria. Metabolically healthy endothelial cells, sorry. Probably right next to the mitochondria as well. <laughs> yes. 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 So this is this brings me. That's really interesting and really nice, nice work. Um, that brings me to something I wanted to mention earlier. Remember how we, we we made the point that exercise training increases capillaries, increases capillarization of each fiber. But we said endurance exercise. So do you want to just say a little bit about that? Like so, strength, sprint, endurance. How you wouldn't expect the same responses because, as you just touched on, you're more the slow muscle fibers are the ones that you know these metabolically ready endothelial cells are going to be mm -hmm. doing their work. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a very nice uh, question. And I have to think very, very deep now. But as far as I know, there is also an, an, an angiogenic response during resistance training. So you also see, no, I... I oh. oh, yeah, this, uh, yeah, uh, you bring me a bit in... in, in uh, uh, that's okay. uncomfortable, but I have to now think very carefully whether this also happens uh, upon resistance training. And obviously, in, in my lab, we are mostly looking at um, mm -hmm. at endurance training and and more, let's say, uh, high intensity endurance training. Um, simply because mice don't do resistance training, but even yeah, during yeah. high intensity endurance training, well, we see an angiogenic response. Yes, yes. 
my feeling was yeah if it's mainly even even hit training high intensity there's a lot of aerobic contribution you know even at the end of a 30 second sprint yeah. in a human at the end you're using a lot of you're close to your vo2 max but yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah i'd have to check that because yeah i guess um my feeling was you get the increased capillaries when you do you know when you need more oxygen delivery rather than sort of anaerobic but i guess it depends yeah. if, the, if, if the resistance and, training is kind of like circuit or something you know what i mean resistance training can differ yeah yeah and mm. i think at the very very end of the spectrum in uh indeed sprint. 100 meter sprint athletes exactly. or 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 heavy heavy weightlifters there it might be different and uh exactly. yeah yeah you have to apologize me for not knowing this i should know this but uh but I think everything that is in between and that has an aerobic component there, there we have, um, I mean, there people have seen. That makes uh, sense. And also, I guess we should say that we don't always get the same in rodents as humans as well. Yeah, that's, that's, that's probably tricky that is, as well. That is, that is really, really uh, important to say. But I do think, and this is also, this is also something, something very interesting, is that what we see in rodents as well as in humans is that this increase in blood vessel density goes alongside an increase in satellite cell content. So whenever mm -hmm. you have more blood vessels, you have more satellite cells, and those satellite cells lie in the proximity of, of these blood vessels. So we, we actually wonder, and, and trying to test now, whether if you would prohibit the new formation of new blood vessels so you you don't allow new blood vessels to form what what ha then happens to those satellite cells in the inside the muscle don't they proliferate D doesn't this pool no. uh, expand and and what is the the interaction between between those two and can you block uh, that can you actually block the uh, angiogenesis the production yeah, of new so we, yeah so we are now using genetic mouse models for this. Oh, so, so we we actually have a mouse model where we uh, reduce the metabolic fitness of endothelial cells so they mm. are not able to form new vessels anymore and nice. we are training these mice uh, now and then we want to see whether the, the the muscle stem cell pool expands and and where it's localized that's and great how do these muscles then adapt when you do resistance training? i think that's a good example of how you need both you know some people are like no no you should only do human studies it's, this is a bit rude, but we used to say, when I said I was only doing human studies, there was some other people, like big name people as well, that were only doing human studies. And when there was a rat study, we'd say, we'd call it a rat's ass study. You know, who gives a rat's ass? You know, who cares what you get in the rat or the mouse, right? But then yeah. I've turned right around. I, I feel like you need both, you know, because you, you can't knock out the genes and the humans, right? Mm -hmm. Although there are I, some I, humans that have knockout, natural knockouts, but yeah. Indeed, yeah. indeed. So, and uh, yeah, I, I'm completely on your side. I am a quite passionate advocate for translational science as well. I mean, even though my lab is heavily molecular biology focused, which allows us to look at mechanisms. Uh, why is something happening? You can, you can tweak things and knock out genes. But, but in the end, you want to translate it to a human setting and see see whether this uh, this is relevant. And um, I always envy those people who are able to combine both uh, mm. both of these things. Um, yeah, since the start of my lab here in, in Switzerland, I mean, we 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 tried a bit, mostly in in patient uh, populations. But uh, it's it's on my to do list to start this up again. Oh, you can't do uh, everything. Translational <laughs> work, some exercise think... uh, work, and uh, we are working on this. Well, things are working for you up to now. Hey, so just to again draw some things together, I saw a tweet. It was really kind of cute. You were saying how your next door neighbor and you in the in the lab had, had hooked up and you were talking about you, how you use knockout mice and whatever and you ended up looking at endothelial cells and exercise and it's you never thought you'd collaborate and whatever why don't you just tell us a little bit about that story that's a nice one of you know keeping your eyes open what your colleague, colleague did oh maybe we could work together yeah, yeah so i uh i have a a colleague and i was sitting next to him in uh some uh boring departmental meetings and he started to talk about this mouse model that he has that uh 
has this gene knocked out and the gene is appled one and nobody does knows what it does the only thing they know because he's really interested in looking at stress responses the only thing they they knew back back in those days is that whenever um you stress a mouse by throwing in it in the water for instance or yeah or stressing it uh, in in general terms the gene that went up the most and the fastest was appled one mm -hmm. and they decided to make this knockout mouse but it didn't respond differently to stress. It didn't, it had no phenotype at all. And then he was sitting next to me and we started to chat and he said like, look, I mean, Katrina, I have this mouse model and uh, that doesn't have a phenotype. And you know what I've, I found that this is, this, this uh, protein is expressed almost exclusively in endothelial cells. And I was like, oh yeah. And so what happens with, with mice? He said, no, the mice are completely fine. And I was very skeptical about those data because usually um, genes that are important for angiogenesis or blood vessel formation, they are embryonically lethal, right? Many of the important genes because you need new blood vessels to grow. And if you don't, can, mm -hmm. cannot form functional blood vessels, you don't grow and you die uh, in utero. And I said, yeah, well, I mean, good, we, we can look at it. And we looked at developmental angiogenesis. The mouse was completely fine, that didn't do anything. And then I had a postdoc in my lab and, and he uh, was really testing uh, the, the setup of a specific um, protocol in my lab where we basically ligate the femoral artery. So we cut the femoral artery and then we see how the muscle revascularizes. So mm -hmm. the muscle gets very hypoxic and then you get this very high um, angiogenic response and, and, and uh, new blood vessels uh, form. And they basically then restore the muscle and the muscle regenerate. So that's, that's a, a model that we now use a lot in the lab. And uh, I said, well, I mean, we we have some of these mice here. There is no phenotype. You can you can uh, you can use them. And he did hind limb ischemia or femoral ligation on those. And he had, all of a sudden he came running in my office. And said, you have to come and have a look. These mm -hmm. mice have huge, huge, huge phenotype. So, actually, by serendipity, we stumbled upon a mouse model that is completely healthy from a developmental point of view but shows impaired pathological uh, angiogenesis. And I find this extremely, extremely interesting because actually very, very few key regulators of blood vessel formation, they show this, this particular phenotype. As I said, most of them are also important during development, which Apple mm -hmm. one uh, is not. And th this is this story that, that very nicely shows that serendipity serendipity sometimes brings you to the to the coolest project so it was a very very nice collaboration but but also to keep your eyes open right that, that negative data yes. or, or lack of a phenotype doesn't always mean there is nothing or the protein doesn't do anything and uh um and also you kept what... going and going you know so you know you didn't give up on it but the other the thing is to link it all in as well is it's increased with exercise right Yes, it's increased with exercise. So we are currently testing whether it affects exercise responses uh, as well. I mean, people people ask me this uh, uh, every time I talk about this protein and, and I'm like, like, oh, yeah, that's the experiment we didn't do yet. <laughs> so we are doing it now. <laughs> but, but, but he or you found it was, in, yeah, you said that it increased with exercise. Um, but you haven't looked at the blood vessel. Yeah, okay. Now, on Twitter, I asked people if they have any questions. I don't know if this is a bit of a side one but someone called Dion who's a endurance cyclist said what's Dr. De Bock's view on blood flow restriction I don't know if you've thought about that so you know training with blood flow restriction because she unfortunately has this thing that's quite a, you know some road cyclists get which is this iliac artery endofibrosis so that you know it's thought to be the continual yeah. cycling Hip flexion. Yeah, it's, it's because of the, the the cycling and the movement that the legs ma the legs make, like hyperflexing, uh, that uh, this iliac artery can like make make a kink or gets mm -hmm. gets uh, squeezed uh, during a movement, and then you get damage of the 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 iliac artery and fibrosis uh, in the end if this happens over and over again. And uh, for for endurance athletes definitely cyclists this is really a disaster because you get reduced blood flow to the muscle 
So reduced oxygen deliveries, reduced nutrient delivery, and this this leads to pain, hypoxic pain in in mm-hmm. in the muscle, but but also a reduction in performance because yeah, oxygen delivery is really crucial. Definitely on high level, uh, high intense exercises where you basically exercise at VO two max. So um, it's a yeah, it's a it's a. It's, no, I guess it's, it's I a guess rare she's... condition, mm-hmm. but quite debilitating. Yeah. Sorry, I guess she's thinking because, you know, some people do this blood flow restriction training where they yeah. purposely reduce their blood flow. She's, I guess she's saying, you know, specifically what are the adaptations? I, I wouldn't expect you to know this, but it's an interesting question. She's yeah, saying so- that maybe you get more adaptations because of the hypoxia. Yeah, well, so with yeah, with mm. blood flow restricted exercise, this is indeed what you aim to achieve. Huh? You you increase hypoxia, so to speak. Um, hope that it it uh, leads to to more adaptations at a lower exercise intensity level because that's the purpose. You exercise at lower intensity, you put more stress on the muscle. In this case, yes, uh, restricting yes. blood flow or, or or oxygen delivery or nutrient delivery, and then you get a better adaptive response. To do this in um, this uh, iliac um, endofibrosis is I, I don't really see see the the link very well because in the end you're already exercising with blood flow restriction, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Because of the endofibrosis, you have reduced blood flow de- uh, delivery, so so it's basically a blood flow restricted response, but then due to a, a, pat- a pathological uh, setting. So you get some adaptations. I um, I I I see this, but for performance, obviously, it it doesn't make a, a yes. huge difference because still you have reduced. Yes. Uh, so maybe during the exercise, in, during during high problems. intensity exercise, you you yes. But then the muscle was trying to respond by having a, a greater adaptation, yeah. but obviously overall you you would be down yeah. on yeah, that. Yeah, I think. Uh, I, Hey, now just other thing I saw looking around again, Twitter is sort of my, I never used to do Twitter, but now that I've started this podcast, I, I looked around and saw that you also said uh, some other bits and pieces that you're working on. So what are you excited about? I see that you've also done some work with um, how exercise can increase leucine um, sensitivity in the muscles. So people are often yeah. interested in protein, especially on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's <laughs> protein, but uh, what, what have you found there? Just, just to, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, I have a I have a postdoc in my lab, Omar, who is really interested in um, protein metabolism, and I am also interested in this from a more molecular point of view and how it links to 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 growth. Um, and and what what he found is that um, if you do resistance type of exercise, that your muscle. Uh, has higher sensitivity for mTORC activation. So basically to to exert this anabolic response and mTORC is the main, let's say, molecular uh, regulator in this. And usually what people what people say is that after resistance training, you have to immediately drink yeah. your whey protein shake because there is this anabolic window no. of opportunity, so to speak, where you have a increased anabolic response. Uh, so this is a bit of the dogma, uh, and and what he actually showed is that this is this window is not immediately after exercise, but 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 it's it's prolonged, and the reason why it is prolonged is that um, uh, resistance exercise actually leads to a complete metabolic adaptations in this way that the muscle is able to take up proteins better, to synthesize Mm. proteins better, or to take up amino acids better, to synthesize specific amino acids better, and to to also sense amino acids uh, better. So it's actually a prolonged, so the window of opportunity is much much longer than than we uh, initially uh, anticipated. This said, I mean, I think in the great majority of the Western population, uh, there is very little evidence supporting the requirement for additional protein shakes uh, after exercise because we consume so many proteins exactly. anyway that uh, this window of opportunity will be used anyway if if we eat sufficient vegetables and and and, mm-hmm. and meat or, 
or a high protein containing food. So uh, just on a side note, but but we are very interested in this um, this molecular environment because, for instance, uh, in, in in people with with anabolic resistance or maybe to link it in the future towards. Uh, um, improved responses to, to exercise training in populations where that have a lower ability for exercise training would be very, very interesting to understand how one can maximize the anabolic response to, to proteins. And that's why we, mm -hmm. we got so in, in, interested in this and are looking at... Uh, yeah, at it's, it's really interesting, this leucine resistance, because it, it's, it reminded me of insulin. Um, sorry, the, the insulin, sorry, loose... Okay. It's interesting this leucine sensitivity after exercise for like up to 48 hours or whatever, because it's very similar to the increase in insulin sensitivity you get for 48 hours. So yes. it's, it's really pretty nice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. And the fact that it was in rodents, it might even be longer in humans. Who knows? Because the rodents have a high metabolism. So for 48 hours in a rodent is a, is a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that's that's indeed a, a very good question, and uh, we we have to look at it uh, at some point whether this is also the case in humans. But I think, I mean, as far as I recall, the studies that have been done in humans they support the evidence that the window of opportunity is is longer than yes. the initial thirty minutes after uh, after exercise. Exactly. So I believe studies have looked okay. at uh, at least 24, 36 hours okay. in there. There's All right, great. So I think we might just uh, think about finishing up. I know you have a meeting soon. So how about we just have some takeaway sort of summary, bottom line. So what is what is the, I don't know, two or three things we want people to take away from this, you know, chat? I think one of the takeaway uh, messages is that muscle adapts to training, but it's not only the muscle. Uh, there are many, many more cell types in the muscle. They, they play a crucial role. And um, that's what we are looking at and we we, we are really passionate about it uh, um, maybe a second second point is that one should always keep your eyes open for for unexpected uh, results okay. the data are the data and i usually follow the data this has my has brought my lap into unexpected endeavors on uh, leucine sensing for instance mm -hmm. or 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 um pulled one in in angiogenesis but exactly. uh, Usually those are uh, exciting, uh, exciting uh, projects. And uh, then, then maybe also third one, maybe for uh, for young researchers. I mean, when I, when I was a PhD, I thought I would be an exercise physiologist for forever, and I would have liked it. But due to some funny situations, I made a huge career shift, and um, now I a bit combine my my exercise physiology or my muscle background with my knowledge in, in developmental and cancer angiogenesis. And I think making these shifts and being interested in also looking at what happens uh, in other fields. Yeah. It gives you, it gives you an opportunity to develop your own niche and to, to, to do something uh, very cool. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much. It's been fun. You're enthusiastic and, uh, Someone said you're an enthusiastic person and you might talk forever, but I think I think we had a good balance there. It's great to be enthusiastic. Actually, I'm, I'm just wrapping it up, but I couldn't help because you talked about cancer and geogenesis and stuff. We had Catherine Smith on and she was talking about how if you people that exercise, they may get more vessels around the tumor and it may help the chemotherapy to be delivered is that yeah yeah, is yeah, that yeah right so yeah yeah so so it's very actually very well described that that even though tumors have a lot of blood vessels these blood vessels are very very poorly functioning so they they are leaky they they don't deliver the blood or the blood leaks out so yeah. they they are very they have a very poor function and it's 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 known that when you exercise these blood vessels normalize so to speak so you get um, yeah, they, they, they function much better and this allows better delivery of chemotherapy, wow. better, um, uh, passage of immune cells that attack the cancer cells. Wow. Um, uh, so, so potentially a better outcome of, uh, yeah, immune or checkpoint in inhibitory, uh, therapy. So there is quite some, some people that, that are looking at uh, That's amazing. exercise effects on on cancer and focusing uh, on 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 the blood vessels in in that setting. That's amazing, and it also shows how integrative exercise is. Because I'm assuming you're not talking about 
you know, ah, oh, if you've got a tumor in your muscle, you're talking about a tumor anywhere in the body, yeah? Oh, yeah. You know, pretty oh, much. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's really Exercise doesn't only make you run faster or cycle, no. cycle faster. It makes you healthy. It makes you smart. It makes you happier. It's, it's a, well, look at us. We're healthy, many smart, and happy. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much again for coming on. That's great. Okay. Thanks okay. a lot. For See you. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Um, please like, subscribe, pass it on to your friends and colleagues. Check out the other podcasts. Thanks again.